Alrighty, so we have just spent some time talking about systematic data, and that's going to be the, the backbone of our inputs that we're going to put into Best Fit. And now we're going to spend some time talking about interval data. So um, in this lecture, we're going to learn how to find and use historical data in, that we're going to use in flood hazard analysis. And we're also going to learn how to enter that data into RMC Best Fit. As a reminder, RMC Best Fit supports three different types of data, systematic data, interval data, and threshold data. And of course, based on its title, you probably guessed that this lecture is going to focus on interval data. Interval data is defined as an observed flood whose magnitude is not known exactly, but is reasonably known to fall within a range of values. Interval data is typically associated with unusually large flood events whose estimates are based on limited or uncertain information. As you know, more data is better. So, therefore, it is important to do research to find as much additional data um, that's practical, um, looking beyond just our systematic period of record. So, when we talk about interval data, we're looking for observed flood events, and in many cases, the magnitude is not known exactly. Um, but it's usually reasonably known to fall within a certain range of, of flow values. And flood intervals are typically used to represent large historic floods and paleo flood PSIs, or paleo stage indicators. In RMC Best Fit, we want to define the most likely value for our observed floods. We also want to define the range of our uncertainty. And we do this by including an upper and a lower estimate for the observed flood. So in this picture, you can see that on this RMC Best Fit chronology plot, the blue point, or cyan, if you want to get specific, what kind of blue it is, um, represents the most likely flood estimate. And the range of uncertainty, or the flood interval, is shown with whiskers that display the upper flood estimate and the lower flood estimate. For large observed historic floods or paleo flood events, it's common to only have an estimate of the peak discharge. So you may have found that along the way when you're researching historical floods. However, we need to perform our volume frequency analysis for the critical duration for our project. In these situations, we're gonna wanna estimate um, a volume for the historic flood event based on the critical duration for our project. And that can be done by estimating a peak to volume ratio um, and you're going to do that based on observed hydrographs that you've already, that you have in your catalog. Um, this example shows an hourly inflow data for a dam, and the peak flow for the observed event is about 117,000 CFS. And we computed a moving average of the four-day volume, and then that's shown here. You can kind of visualize that. So each of those orange bars it represents a running four-day average and you can see that the, the highest one is the one that we're gonna choose um, as our four day um, average volume, and that's about 70,000 CFS. So to get our ratio, our peak to volume ratio, um, we divide 117,000 by 70,000 and we get 1.7. Put another way, a four day average flow is 60% of the peak flow value. Typically, you'll want to estimate this ratio based on several observed flood events, and then select a representative or average ratio to use in flood hazard analysis. And we'll explore this concept more in one of our hands-on exercises. There are many sources of historic information um, that you can gather uh, this type of information from. So USACE has water control manuals for each of their dams. Um, USACE also has a SWIMS database. And there are also definite project reports or design memoranda and other design reports um, for each of the dams. And then um, a lot of times districts will have their own flood reports based on large floods that have happened in the basin. Um, uh, USACE, uh, oh, sorry, USGS has an instantaneous data archive as well and water supply papers, um, design reports. You can also look in Bulletin 17C sometimes for this type of data. Um, there's also information that can be found in newspaper archives and local libraries um, and personal accounts. Um, 
Also historical societies that sometimes have this type of data. So recently I was talking to my old boss in Kansas City and he was able to find evidence of um, some pretty interesting changes to the land cover in one of the basins and also um, some really interesting uh, reports that they found in um, a library and they scanned it and were able to use a lot of the information in a frequency study. So um, sometimes it takes a little bit of boots on the ground work to dig through and find this information. I like to call that reconnaissance, which makes me feel like I'm in a cool movie or something. Um, also, another good source of information is after action and water supply papers. So um, a lot of times if there's a specific flood event, um, it'll be recorded somewhere, um, especially if it's a notable flood event. So taking the time to do research can really add significant value to the flood hazard analysis. Um, so I'm going to just show several pictures in case you're not familiar with some of these types of data. Um, this is an example of a historic inflow hydrograph from a USACE water control manual. Um, this particular one is Hurricane Agnes. And notice that it includes flood routing as well. So you've got your inflow, outflow, and your elevation hydrographs all shown in this plot. Um, also, if we get this type of information, um, in the old days, we had to plot it with our hands and a pencil and a ruler, or maybe a post-it note, whatever your preferred straightage is. Um, but uh, at the bottom, there's a little link to a dig digitizer that you can use that's free online, and that really saves a lot of time. So. Um, Okay, another example, uh, this is a USACE definite project report for Blakely Mountain Dam. And you can see in the figure that the inflow hydrograph is shown, as well as the incremental and cumulative precipitation information and a calculated unit hydrograph. So this can be a very useful type of information. Um, here's another one from a U USACE design memorandum for Hills Creek Dam. These figures have hydrographs from multiple events and also have isohydal maps for each event. Um, note that the most unit hydrograph derivations come from large historic events, and therefore documents often have historic inflow hydrographs, and that's what we need for our flow frequency analysis. USACE district flood reports are also referenced in some cases by the USGS in water, um, water supply papers for specific floods. Um, for example, December 1950, December 1955, and December 1964 floods in California, Oregon, and Washington, and other western states. Um, and again, using one of those digitizers, online digitizers, can be really helpful when you have that kind of data. Uh, here is an inflow hydrograph from the USGS Instantaneous Data Archive, and this one's from Consumas River in California. So that's pretty handy to have that information. And then um, USGS water supply papers contain data on specific floods. Um, so this example is December 1950, um, 1955, and 1964. And then um, instantaneous stream flow data at variable time increments, usually by hourly at peaks or inflection points, are shown lower left, um, can be keyed into the spreadsheet or other software. And then hourly values can be interpolated um, to use an RFA. So, um, okay, so we've just been talking about historical floods and how a lot, of, sometimes we actually have, we are fortunate enough to have the hydrograph itself um, recorded. Sometimes all we have is a peak flow, um, but in, in both of those cases, we can add that information into our analysis. Um, this is another type of data, which is paleo flood data, and some of you may be familiar with this. Um, it's a type of historical data that can be described um, with a flow interval. Um, they require, uh, these types of studies require a multidisciplinary team of quaternary, I might have said that, said that correctly, I'm not sure, I'm not a geologist, I, I apologize if I mispronounced it, Quatern quaternary, uh, thanks, quaternary geologists, hydrologists and hydraulic engineers, and those three disciplines uh, work together to do these paleo studies. Uh, so basically, if you're not familiar, a paleo flood study is going to look for geologic clues that provide evidence of a prehistoric flood. And keep in mind that when we talk about prehistoric floods, we're not talking about the dinosaurs here. Um, we are talking about before or pre the historic period. So in other words, before our period where we started recording on river riverine gauges. Um, 
So they can be 500 years ago, they can be 1,000 years ago, they might be 2,000 years ago, but we use the geologic evidence that is in the field to help us identify evidence of floods. And I, was, I will admit that I was a skeptic when I first started hearing about paleo flood studies. But um, when I learned a little bit more about how the modeling is done, I, I became a believer. So anyway, basically, um, you can see in this graphic that they're able to take um, information such as um, erosional scars or deposition of um, slack water deposits. Slack water means like when the water is slowing down on the recessional limb, that sediment falls out of solution and then is deposited on terraces in the topography. And then we are able to go back then and, and take organic material from those deposits and age date that information. And then we combine that with a hydraulic modeling effort so that we can see how much water would it have taken to get up to that level in the river channel. And then we can estimate, you know, within uncertainty, um, what that flow, what that peak flow would have been. And so we're able to then incorporate that information into our analysis. So that's kind of a high level description, but um, the other thing we, and I'll talk about this in a different presentation, um, or one of us will, um, we can also find evidence that there haven't been any floods at a certain elevation um, because the soil is very well developed um, and we call those non-exceedance bounds. But I won't get into that too much right now. But this, this particular PSIs, or paleo stage indicators are um, the indication that we have seen a flood, that there's been a, an observed flood in this channel and that it's gotten up to this elevation. And then that's what um, we are gonna use a, a flood interval or a flow interval to record that type of information. Um, yeah. So, so it's two pieces of information. It's the age of the of the information and it's the flow that um, that reached that elevation. Um, or those are the two pieces of information, I suppose you could say that we are including in our analysis. The geologists in the report are gonna talk about the elevations out in the field that they collected the data from as well. Um, and because there is a lot of uncertainty in these types of analyses, we're able to incorporate our estimate of the uncertainty within those flow interval whiskers. Okay, so we've talked about two different kinds of floods that we can use flow intervals to describe historic floods and paleo stage indicators. Um, they are the types of information that often have a lot of uncertainty or large uncertainty. Um, and we wanna typically include an estimate of that uncertainty in our flood hazard analysis. Um, and that can be accomplished by using the range of flows as we discussed. Um, so when you're putting this into RFA, you're gonna be making a most likely estimate and an upper and a lower estimate. And the upper and lower are gonna be the whiskers. Um, and since there are many sources of error, um, it's important to think a little bit about what those sources might be. Um, so there might be measurement errors in how they collected the data. There might be estimation errors. There might be modeling errors. Um, and there's also natural, natural variability um, in peak to volume ratios that you develop. So um, there could be some error or uncertainty introduced there. Um, when we can't directly quantify our uncertainty, a reasonable rule of thumb is that plus or minus 20% that we mentioned earlier. Um, and it's loosely based on the USGS guidelines, um, but we found it's, it's a good rule of thumb to use if you don't have something else that's d helping to define what that range of flows is. And when we have um, paleo stage indicators, we actually are going to have a value to enter for the high and the low value um, because we'll, we will have done some hydraulic modeling and varied our end values or um, our roughness coefficient or um, other parameters in the modeling to give us a range for our uncertainty. Um, the smaller the flood interval, so this is probably pretty logical, but keep this in mind, the smaller the flood interval, what you're communicating is that you have higher confidence in that piece of information. Um, and so you have to consider if that's appropriate or not. Um, and when we have, as you know, conversely, if you have a large flow interval, that means we have less confidence in our estimate of that flow. Um, and I'm sure you're used to me saying it by now, but of course this requires engineering judgment. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, anyway, okay. Um, before we get started putting the interval data into RMC Best Fit, 
I want to make sure that you're aware of some of the requirements for the data input. The first thing is that the year must be a unique value between negative 100,000 and positive 100,000. So hopefully that gives you a wide enough range that any kind of data you might have will be able to be entered into best fit. Um, also, the year cannot overlap with any other year in the systematic data table. So you're um, like the question Amanda asked earlier, what if my highest flood has a lot of uncertainty and I want to reflect that in my analysis? What you would do is you would remove that year from the systematic data set and then you would enter it instead in the interval data set as that year um, and enter in your uncertainty on the plus and minus on the high and the low bounds. Um, another pretty logical requirement is that the lower bound must be less than the most likely value and the upper bound must be greater than the most likely value so that it has some built in function to make sure you don't fat finger a number and accidentally have a weird, a weird value in there for that your low and your high estimate. Um, and then for an LP3 distribution, the flow value must be a positive number because negative flows don't mean anything in our flood frequency analysis. Um, and then um, the first step to entering flow frequency data, or excuse me, flow interval data, is to create and open an, an input data set in the project. So I'll show you where that is on the screen. Um, and then we want to navigate to the interval data tab. So kind of highlight that as well. Um, a new row or rows can be added to the table by selecting the add row to the bottom of the table icon. And I believe Garrett mentioned this earlier, um, but you can then copy and paste or manually enter the year, the lower, most likely an upper value of the flow interval for any observed historical or observed paleo flood estimate. Um, and you won't need to use the probably a copy and paste too much because you're not going to be copying like a long, most likely you're not copying a long list, probably have a, just a few entries in this section. Um, but it's pretty intuitive. And then um, the chronology plot will automatically update with that information once you've entered it. And um, you'll be able to see that most likely estimate as the blue or the cyan point, and then the upper and the lower will be reflected in the whiskers. And that's, that's highlighted there. Okay, so resources. So we've highlighted this particular one a number of times. Um, this is a great reference on the RMC website. And um, for more information on how to handle upstream regulation, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's also that other document. Um, and then there's a third document um, that is uh, about data sources out on the RMC website. And so all three of those documents can be really helpful in um, tips and tricks on how to how to gather this type of information.